All right, what is up? Uh, today, Audrey's, Audrey Lords, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. This is a pretty seminal text for anyone that's in like uh, gender studies or women's studies or critical race program or any kind of thing like that or English program. Um, this text will come up. But when you do read it, chances are you just read the chapter or the one article that where Audrey Lord recounts her experiences um, giving a talk at a conference, which I'm going to go through here, but I have it in book form that includes a few other essays as well. So I'm going to timestamp this. So if you just are just curious about that one chapter, which would be unfortunate, you know, the whole the whole book is quite good. It's short. It's like 50 pages. Um, then the other chapters are, uh, you can get stuff out of that as well. Uh, but I'll include the timestamp in case you just want that chapter. Um, but before then, uh, you can find this on Podbean and iTunes are the best, your best bets. Uh, I'll have a link for Podbean in the description, as well as my Patreon account. So if anyone can give anything there, that would be cool. Uh, the last thing I want to do is start filling these uh, episodes with like ads or something, because that sucks. Um, so if you can, that's great. But if not, then absolutely don't worry about it. Uh, and if you just want a good giggle, I put in some funny goals there that I think, you know, I don't know, I found them humorous. Uh, but without further ado, let's get into this. So the first chapter is titled, Poetry is Not a Luxury. Now the general crux of this chapter, or the argument, is that poetry is not something that people can just use in a kind of frivolous or superfluous way. For Audre Lorde, it holds a very important function for survival for very many people, especially subjugated people. Specifically here, she's talking about women, and more specifically, black women. Uh, but I think, and I don't want to put words in her mouth, but I think that m much of what she writes here uh, is applicable to many marginalized um, or racialized bodies in a whole slew of different settings. So for her, poetry serves a function of revealing something that is, has been repressed by a kind of oppressive mechanism. Now, she describes this kind of potential with a few different adjectives. She says that in all subjugated people, or in all women specifically, uh, she says there's a dark, ancient, and deep zone that essentially houses the creativity to oppose oppression. Like it's a kind of anti-oppressive zone. Now, this is where creativity lies. This is where I think love comes from. These are things that are diametrically opposed to domination. And she goes further as to suggest that this logic, that is this understanding of this zone that is um, untouchable by domination, goes against everything that we understand through a kind of Eurocentric model. So I could only, um, you know, we can only assume, you know, she's talking about things like for example, maybe the idea of duality. So the idea of duality is that there's like a soul and body split. And both of those things are pretty easily uh, categorized. That is, we know what the soul is. It has a relationship to our idea of self and the divine and things that are kind of intangible. That is things we can't touch within ourselves. Whereas the body is, you know, our physical corporal being. Whereas with what I think Audre Lorde is doing here is presenting us with another dimension that is something even deeper than the soul, which is so often in the European kind of mindset or the Eurocentric mindset, uh, given over to a kind of whiteness. It's given over to a very specific, you know, European idea of what the subject is. So poetry for Lorde is a, the kind of physical, well, physical, it's the kind of manifestation on the outside of this deeper zone. And what it does here is give a name to the nameless. That is, and let's think about, um, let me venture an example. And this might seem kind of far afield, but give me a second and I'll wrap it in together, I think, in a, an acceptable way. When we try to communicate a certain feeling, be it, you know, an emotional feeling or, uh, you know, bodily sensation with language, we run against, run up against certain impasses. So the way I like to think about this is like, when, when you go to a doctor, uh, doctor's office, and you know, they ask you to describe your symptoms, describe how you're feeling, there's always 
um, a disconnect between what you're saying and what the person is hearing. And this is just really speaking from my own experience, but when speaking to someone in a kind of position of authority like that, I can never seem to actually convey what I'm feeling to the person in the way that I want them to understand it. Uh, so it is, you know, my own experience, but if anyone can relate. Um, now, whereas for Lord, she sees poetry as the way to actually communicate those feelings. And I don't mean, you know, the single feelings that I, David, experience, but any one of us experience. It is that way to give a kind of language to something that would otherwise be languageless. It would be without a kind of possibility with language. Now, Lord does attribute this a kind of potential to, to women, specifically, saying that women being marginalized in the way they are, you know, not only experience this uh, kind of poetic side as, an, as a necessity to oppose oppression, but it is also a kind of like truth, or what I will say here, like an ontological part that is part of what it means to be a woman that embodies or that embraces this kind of poetic side. So for her then, what she says is that the oppressor recognizes this and the oppressor tries with every breath they can muster to kind of sequester, that is to silence, that is to shut down that capacity of women to challenge oppression just by virtue of them being themselves. And this comes out and this will develop a little more in the next chapter, but there are certain ways that that is kind of uh, sublimated. So sublimation means um, it is suppressed in women and then it comes out in other forms. And one of the examples she gives is like pornography uh, that is m much more complicated than it sounds right now. It's not a condemnation of sex work, but we'll, we'll get there. But any kind of attempt on the part of women to speak their emotions, to kind of speak the language of that deep, ancient, dark, you know, the recesses of their uh, emotional kind of emotional um, capacity, any uh, charge against that is kind of leveled at, by saying, you know, women, when they embrace that, are childish. They are being irrational. They are being, um, you know, they're, it, they're being emotional. Like they don't have a kind of validity behind them because of those things that men, in this case, use to uh, silence women. Now for Lord, she challenges the kind of uh, Rene Descartes idea of the cogito ergo sum. So that is the idea, I think, therefore I am, for her to say instead, as for black women, that framework is kind of uh, turned on its head, where it's not, I think, therefore I am, it is, or it becomes, um, I feel, therefore I can be free. So it's for her that even that capacity to feel, which is inextricably tied to emotion, which is inextricably tied to that deep, you know, recess of um, kind of dark, ancient, emotional, uh, like an emotional pool that comes out in the form of poetry. And it is through that that black women are able to be free for her because the white oppressor tries to always take away feeling. You know, it has to be rational. It has to be, you know, perfect. It has to be, um, it has to follow a certain kind of set framework so that it could be understood by the Eurocentric, you know, gaze. So all of this signals to Lord the necessity of poetry to oppose that uh, that kind of oppressive gaze. Now here, we move into the second chapter titled The Uses of the Erotic. So like poetry, Audre Lorde attributes a certain space to eroticism. So like poetry, Lorde says that the erotic is a site of power that the oppressor tries to, tries to shut down. So they do this in a few ways. There's, they do it in the same way as they oppress the poetic, that is, they uh, ascribe it to a kind of irrationality. They say that it is just, you know, bodily emotion that doesn't have any place in, you know, higher learning or higher culture. So it gets shut down. But this gets sublimated, so I already mentioned what that means, in a few different ways. So men kind of push it away, but they take from it what they want. That is, they romanticize the idea of uh, female eroticism and turn it for their own, into their own benefit. 
So the example she gives is like objectification and pornography, uh, which for her um, dissociates the erotic from its radical potential and turns it into something for the male gaze, to borrow uh, uh, Laura Mulvey's term. So Lord thinks that it's no surprise that there is this attempt to shut down the erotic or to control it in various arenas like pornography or to keep it, you know, only in the bedroom, uh, which for her, and I, I don't want to, I don't know for sure. Uh, so if anyone does know, the erotic by no means is reducible only to sex or the act of sex. Uh, it, to me, it, it seems to encapsulate the entire spectrum from love to romance to and love in so many different ways, you know, monogamous, polygamous, uh, friendship, love, love with, you know, family, love with uh, animals, love with the world, love with the spirit, you know, whatever, um, anything like that, that gets, you know, wrapped up in the nice, easily consumable package of, you know, pornography, which can then be, you know, turned for a profit, because it's no surprise that the, uh, the porn industry is, you know, quite a few billion dollar industry every year. Uh, so it benefits men in a number of ways. That is, it get, gives them money, which is recognized in this, you know, cultural setup as being a marker of success, which they internalize as, you know, an affirmation of their position. But it also sequesters it. It shuts down any kind of potential that the erotic might have on its own and turns it into something consumable, something that can be made uh, to profit off of. Now, what does the erotic actually allow for? Well, Audre Lorde says in a very interesting way that the erotic is what makes excellence possible and that the erotic leads to a satisfaction like no other. So what does this mean? Uh, well, to be honest, I don't know. I'm a, I'm, you know, this stupid white guy. Like, I don't, um, I don't know, like, don't want to speak for Lord. Um, but what I can maybe hypothesize is that because the erotic opposes, to some extent, uh, the structure that is indicative of the kind of Eurocentric model, then therefore it opens up a kind of, it presents a foray, that is, it presents an opening, a, a kind of potential for newness. And it is only by virtue of this newness can, you know, excellence come about. Whereas if, you know, there's just a total submission to the structure, then, you know, you're always determined in advance, you are set within certain constraints and limits that do not allow you to be yourself in any kind of excellent way. And that for, well, and, and for Lord. So long as women are out of touch with themselves, that is, they're out of touch with the erotic, then they will be susceptible to oppression. And, you know, we can follow that through. They, were, they are therefore, um, the possibility for excellence is foreclosed to them. Now, here we arrive at uh, the master's tools, chapter three here. The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. So this is a pretty famous essay where Audre Lorde thinks about uh, or kind of reflects on comments at the New York University Institute for the Humanities, which took place in 1978, where this kind of conference, and this is indicative of so many conferences and so many classes uh, in the university, it's, it's shocking, really, um, where she comments on how uh, the panels that were given clearly separated, you know, feminist issues from black feminist issues, you know, from, you know, women's issues in uh, of marginalized communities and so on and so forth. So what that did was it kind of uh, gave the idea that feminism is, you know, a white woman's game and everything else is derivative and it deserves its own space on its own. Now, anyone in the university setting can probably, you know, relate to this, where if anyone's taken a course in the humanities, you know, one of the last weeks of school is going to be dedicated to gender. And then the one following that is going to be dedicated to race. And then the prof, you know, wipes their hands of it and they go on with their, their thing as though, you know, everything else is what is important. And then, oh, we feel guilty. We have to tack these, uh, these kind of subjects on to the end. So in this, uh, conference, she says that primarily lesbian women, let alone lesbian women of color and third world women were 
left out. Like they were just kind of tokenized uh, where she comments that she's like one of the only black women there and makes a big deal of it, you know, as she should. Well, she should. She shouldn't be the one having to do that work, but, you know, good on her for doing it. So there's a, necess- a necessity, Lord, I am, Lord suggests, to welcome the voices of women that aren't white, that is, women that have vastly different experiences from, you know, white Western women in the global north, because it is only by opening up the dialogue to welcome difference can the master's tools be shed so new tools can be acquired. And that is because for her, white women, you know, the ones that have taken over feminism, are in bed, so to speak, with, you know, white oppressors. So one of the examples she gives is that, you know, when white women are going to these conferences on feminism, women of color are staying at home watching after their kids. You know, these tenured uh, white women profs that make tons of money talking about issues relating to women, while ironically, you know, they have women working for them in their houses, like especially black women and, and, and Latina women. So as long as the feminist narrative is dominated by white women, then those structures will remain, according to Lord. That is, white women will continue to do these things while women of color are taking on uh, extra labor, they are being um, silenced, they are being excluded from these spaces, that is, these spaces that talk about feminist issues, um, and where I, you know, naively say maybe this stuff is getting better, these trends are so noticeable everywhere, where... Um, especially in Canada, where, uh, you know, women's studies, or not women's studies, um, many indigenous studies courses, I don't know why I made that mistake, are taught by white people, like white people teaching about indigenous uh, culture, and indigenous, uh, in, sorry, indigenous uh, struggle and indig- indigenous uh, oppression, which is like, wh- what, why? <laughs> like, what is happening here? Like, why do white people think that they can just speak for anyone and they have that voice that that you know the kind of neutral white voice that is able to encapsulate all experience because of their objective like stance okay now from there chapter four the uses of anger colon women responding to racism so she says right off the bat here that because racism racism is something motivated by anger, it can only be responded to angrily. That is, it cannot be responded to nicely. It cannot be responded to with patience, even though that is what, like, you know, the oppressor wants. When someone gets upset about racism, the oppressor says, well, you know, why are you getting mad at me? I didn't, you know, mean to, like, hurt you in this way, or I didn't mean to do this, uh, which, you know, takes on the... Um, which is called like white tears in some settings where a white person will be called out for being racist or saying something racist and they will have a very strong emotional reaction. And what that results in is the person who is calling them out having to then uh, console that person that got offended for being called out. So then it turns um, the problem from the racist action to the fact that this person is now upset. So instead of the person saying, oh my God, I'm sorry, I won't do that again and I will do my best to educate other people, it is, and I'm not going to act it out because I can't act, um, they start to cry or have a very strong emotional reaction that completely takes away from what they said. Now one of the side effects of this, or maybe it's not so much a side effect, it's right up in many people's faces, uh, is that black women have, you know, a reputation for being harsh or, or angry, um, which Audrey Lord recounts an experience where she uh, was speaking with a, like a colleague or another um, feminist, you know, white feminist uh, thinker, scholar, who said that, you know, black women would do so much better at like conferences or they'd be like welcome more if they just weren't so like angry all the time. And what this adduces, adduces for Lord, that is, provides evidence for is the fact that white women see racism as being an issue for women of color. They don't see 
racism as being an issue that they can take on, that they can make uh, a priority in their lives, which essentially only serves to in intensify and to normalize that racism. So this puts the onus on women of color to fix, you know, oppression. To which Audre Lorde says, and I quote, no woman is responsible for altering the psyche of her oppressor, which is exactly what, you know, she's identifying in these white women, these white feminists, who, by ignoring these issues, place all the responsibility on the people that directly experience them, which makes it that much harder. Because not only now are these women dealing with the oppression that they've already been dealing with, but then they're given the added burden of having to be the ones to correct it. And this becomes extra difficult when, the, um, or let me recount this in another way. Uh, Audre Lorde says that, uh, and I think this is correct, second wave feminism taught women to be angry at men. But she says that nowhere in there did women receive uh, the kind of roadmap to understanding or to, um, to yeah, to understanding how white women or how women of color should be angry at other white women because for white women that doesn't that doesn't register white feminists that doesn't register because for them it's you know it's the man that's the problem like i'm i'm a feminist i'm i'm not the problem here so by doing that white feminists are able to absolve themselves that is they're able to uh wash away their guilt and to displace it onto men, who are who are of course you know co-conspirators in this in this oppressive scheme. In fact, they are the conspirators. But w white feminists can't be left off the hook, and that is exactly what you know this anger is for. This anger is meant to di be directed towards all people that are racist, that promote a racist agenda. So for for Lord, having white women be feel guilty for, you know, saying something wrong is a small price to pay for what it may allow for in, you know, ending or ending, let's not be too uh, utopian here, but of making or alleviating the burden of oppression on women of color. And then finally here, that pushes us into chapter five of the final chapter titled Learning from the 1960s. So thinking back, Lord says that she had a pretty she was quite fascinated with uh, the work of Malcolm X and his activism, but said that she had some problems with it, notably the kind of misogyny that was tied to many of the black power movements. And she says that her feelings about him changed toward the end of his life when he started to give more space towards like, um, you know, what might be like an intersectional politics that is recognizing that women of color or let's just, in this case, black women, experience oppression differently from black men. So it's important to recognize that the, because they experience racism, and sexism, oppression in different ways, then therefore we cannot have, you know, the blanket solution to, uh, to racism or to oppression simply come from the sky, right? This has to be something that's constantly worked towards that takes as she says, you know, a multiplicity of perspectives to get at the heart of the matter. Now, what this demanded was essentially cooperation. So people with different perspectives on the matter had to be heard, whereas what she remembers seeing was that there was a lot of silencing going on in these kinds of spaces, where she says that it was a kind of like uh, these get-togethers, that is, with the Black Power Movement, were kind of pageants, she says, for oppression Olympics, which isn't her language, but it's something that, you know, we, um, anyone kind of versed in this stuff would understand the term today, where, gen or where Lord often felt like she wasn't black enough. So people would look down upon her, you know, with, um, and see her as being like not experiencing oppression in the way that, you know, people that were quote unquote more black would experience that oppression. Now, this wasn't only directed uh, by black men against black women. She says that among black women, there was a lot of um, problems too, where, for example, she recounts an experience where a black woman was, in her words, uh, trashed and silenced for having a white husband 
because, you know, that was in the eyes of some of the people there, like, you know, sleeping with the enemy, which was a problem. So Lord wants to do away with all of that and say, like, you know, as a movement, we cannot silence each other like that. We have to recognize the common stake here. So this demands for her, the way that she kind of worked through that, you know, the oppression she was experiencing in a place that was supposed to be fighting oppression, which must be so alienating. You know, she said that she confided in her poetry, her life, her work, her energies, essentially to make it through all the expectations placed upon her, not to mention she was raising children. Uh, she was dealing with, you know, the fact that as a lesbian, she was being oppressed in that way, which, you know, you can only imagine how difficult that was. So for her, this, and this is kind of like the sketch of what this resistive potential should look like. It should be at once individual. So now before you, um, you know, turn this off because of what I'm, me saying it's individual, let me specify that it demands a kind of concordance that is an agreement in each person suffering oppression in themselves with what she called that deep, ancient, kind of dark recess that houses the potential to challenge oppression. Now, for each person, that is different. Each person that suffers oppression does not suffer it the same way, nor is their way of dealing with it the same. So the way that one person might survive through oppression is different from another. So it demands a kind of individual effort to recognize that. But then the community must come together. There must be a communal effort that, you know, fosters that potential, you know, that makes it easier for, in this case, women to um, recognize, you know, the potential that they have themselves and how they can make their lives easier, you know, to make it through this time, which then as individuals having come together can then operate against uh, systematic forms of oppression, which I think more or less, really, you know, captures the essence of what uh, Lord was doing here and finishes off the book. Um, and I hope that I did this book justice. Uh, it's it's a nice little book for anyone who hasn't read it. Uh, it's like as I said, it's like fifty pages, so it's, you should definitely read it. Don't confide in me because um, I'm you know, obviously at a distance being, you know, a privileged white cis male. Uh, but I hope I didn't do a violence to this. And if I did, if anyone's willing to put in the effort to tell me about it, I would love to hear it. Um, but just know I, I, I tried, uh, I tried to not do that, but I would love to hear any challenges to how I characterize this book because I want to learn. I want to learn. But for those that made it, made it this far, thanks a lot, uh, and I'll see you.